No, that wasn't my intention. What happened? Okay. Uh, again, quick, quick note. Or a couple of notes. Uh, some of you were going to give me uh, your lab notebook to look over and give them back to you on Monday. I think there were a few of you, yeah, a few more of you. Um, so make sure to do that to get it great. And the lab reports, please take time to look at the comments. Um, it takes a while to grade those lab reports between Cindy, Chelsea, and I. Each one of us spent 20, 25 minutes on one lab report. So in total, each lab report takes us about an hour to grade, making sure to give you enough feedback. So I know you take a lot of time writing these lab reports, but feel rest assured that it takes us a long time to grade them too. And take some few minutes just to look at the comments. There, you might find them helpful, we hope. And if you have questions, let us know. I, I can see some of you are really getting better and it shows that you've read your comments and I appreciate that. Some of you are repeating the same mistakes. So not many, but few. So please take some time looking at those. Okay, so let's finish up. Uh, pH and titratable acidity, we, since we did not finish the lecture, I'm starting with a recap so that we can continue where we left off. Um, so, if two acids have the same concentration, do they always have the same pH? Claire? No. Why is that? Why no? Uh, they might have a different Yes. So some of them will have, um, would be stronger acids than others. So if we say, let's say HCl is a strong acid, it will dissociate more readily. It will reduce the pH more readily than an organic acid. So with that, um, at same concentration, HCl will be at a lower pH than citric acid, for example. What does TA affect in food? Titratable acidity, Michelle. Flavor. And another aspect related to flavor for fruits specifically? Maturity. So a higher bricks to acid ratio would be a fruit that is more mature than another fruit that has lower bricks to acid ratio. Uh, what does pH impact in food? Yes, Erica? Enzymatic reactions, what else? Microbial growth. Uh, enzymatic reaction, microbial growth, um, how determine the temperature of pasteurization, for example, if it's an acidic food or um, neutral food. Uh, what is PKA? Yes, Ben? That's it. So pKa is the pH at which you have equal concentration of dissociated acid and non-dissociated acid, and that's when you have maximum buffering capacity. Can an organic acid buffer at multiple pHs? Yes, Sven? Uh, yes. Why? Uh, different compounds have different how many groups? Carboxyl groups, yes. That is true. If you have citric acid, you have three carboxyl groups, so it will have three pKa values, so it'll buffer at three different pHs. Uh, acetic acid has one carboxyl group, it will have one pKa and will buffer at one pH value. Okay, we stopped here last time, so bring that piece of paper you were working on last time and continue with this. This is an, an application of the um, of the equation of pH and pKa. Henderson-Hasselbach equation application. There they are. I can tell. <laughs> So 
So it was traffic walking down here, right, John? Because of rain. Get out your piece of paper. We're solving the one that you were using last time. Hopefully you have it with you. Seems like Ben has it. Where is it? Do you have that piece of paper? <laughs> You were just looking up. I thought you were ready. OK. So what was that equation that you wanted to apply? from now on. That means you need to memorize it. You will be using it not only in this class, but you will use it in chemical reactions when you prepare buffers. So sure we have one unknown in the equation. How can we do that? If we are looking for a percentage, was anybody going to say anything? Yes, Jenny. Yeah, so um, we want <coughs> the conjugate base. Yeah. So we could say x divided by 100 minus x for log. Ah, OK. So we want the percentage of lex, uh, lactic acid in dissociated. Um, so we want A minus, you said, right? right? So we put log x over 100 minus x, right? OK. And then we, we plug in the values pH. What we want is 4.7, and the pKa is 3.8. 86. So in this case, our concentration is in percentage. Um, so we do the math. Can you do the math? 4.7 minus 3.86, what would that quickly? Uh, and equal log x over 100 minus x. So what would be that value in your scientific calculator or graph calculator? So what you want is x over 100 minus x. 6.91. Huh? 6.91. 8. 9.1. 9.1. OK, then you do algebra. Here. So x equals 691 minus 6.91x. So 7.91x equals 691, and x would be? 0.91. You can see. So 691 divided by 791, 7.91. 87.4%. So in this case, I did it slightly differently. I assumed. Um, H A plus A minus is one equal one. And then I got the value 
0.87, and then percentage multiplied by 100, you get 87. So you can either put 1 here and then convert to a percentage later on, or you can put 100 and you'll get the value in a percentage right away. So either way is correct. Okay, so we said titratable acidity is basically you are titrating with a base to determine uh, the equivalence point. And at equivalence, you will have a rapid increase in pH due to <coughs> depletion of, of AH. A rapid, the depletion of AH will give you a zero, almost close to zero value, and that will be a rapid will result in a rapid increase in pH. Um, and then um, you can determine that either by measuring the pH or by using a phenolphthalein indicator. Using a pH, sometimes you get slow response. It you you should be. Um, um, you have that pH meter probe inserted in your sample, and when you are titrating and then you shake, it takes a while until the reading is stabilized for you to record it, and you think that you didn't get to the pH, so you might overshoot. So when you're using a pH to determine titratable acidity, you want to be very slow and careful and make sure that your value and the pH meter is stabilized before you add um, more drops, especially when you are close to the equilibrium point. Um, with using phenolphthalein indicator, your indication of equiv equivalence is the change in color. So that's more obvious than the pH meter or quicker. And uh, since we said earlier, why did we say that the endpoint is 8.2, not 7? I mentioned that last time, is your endpoint is a little bit basic is not really neutral as what you expect theoretically. When the, when the acid is neutralized with a base, you expect that the pH would be neutral, but it's slightly basic. Yes, Drew? Because the salts in there Yes, because your A minus, your conjugate base, would actually um, result in a little bit higher pH. And that is perfect when you're using phenolphthalein indicator because the change in color from colorless to pink or reddish pink is around the pH of 8 to 9.6, so right around the end point of your reaction. So you will, once you reach 8, 8.2, the color changes, and that's when you know that you've reached uh, equilibrium. And this pH is ideal also because food acids do not buffer at this pH. So you ha the pKa's of the organic acids that we usually measure do not buffer at this pH, so this pH is ideal. Um, however, if you have phosphoric acids in the beverages that you are measuring acidity of, or you have carbonated beverages where you have CO2 in water and give you carbonic acid, these will buffer at this pH. So meaning, and you'll, you'll experience that in the lab, on Monday, because they buffer in the pH, on the, around that pH, you're not going to see a shift in the indicator color. Or if the color changes, it will fade. And as it fades, you think that you need to titrate more. So you keep adding NUH, and then you overshoot the pH. You get to a higher pH than 8.2 because you keep adding, um, because the color of the phenolphthalein indicator does not stabilize. So in that case, what do we do if we have these acids and we don't want to overshoot? What would be the best way of measuring using a pH meter or an indicator? A pH meter. At this case, you would, as soon as you get 8.2 with the pH meter, even though the phenolphthalein indicator did not change color because of the buffering of these two acids in there, then you would just stop the titration. Also, you would use pH meter when you are titrating uh, juice or a solution that is colored. 
like tomato juice, for example, or apple juice, or uh, grape juice, you barely can see change of phenolphthalein uh, color. So you would use a pH meter for those. OK, in order to um, titrate and get your accurate percent titratable acidity, you want to titrate with a base. But that base needs to be standardized. By standardization, we mean that you are sure of the accurate normality of that base. And the way you're going to do that in the lab, and the way to do that is you standardize your base solution against a standard acid. But why do we care about standardizing NUH? Because you're going to say, I'm weighing exactly the amount of NUH I need to produce 0.1 normal. Why do I need to standardize that? By calculation, it's 0.1 normal. However, when you prepare your solution, there is a possibility that CO2 from the atmosphere can dissolve, enter your solution, and CO2 will react with NOH and produce sodium carbonate, which will precipitate. And when that happens, there is a change in the concentration of NOH. So it will no longer be at 0.1 or even close to 0.1 normality, let's say, or one normality, whatever is the normality that you are preparing. So two things we do uh, to avoid this is, obviously, when we prepare our reagents, we want to prepare water uh, using water that has no CO2 in it. And way, the way to do that is you just get DD water and boil it. So you bubble CO2 out. And then when you store your reagent, when you prepare your reagent and store it, you store it with an ascarite trap. You'll see that in the lab. It's like a syringe that you would fill with uh, silica that is coated with NOH. So in the syringe here, you will have um, coated silica, NOH coated silica. So CO2 that is uh, in the atmosphere of that reagent bottle will be picked up by the NOH the, in this uh, coating, coating that silica and then will prevent the CO2 from dissolving in your solution. And then to get the exact normality of your solution, because you might not have weighed exact amount, you might not have diluted or used a volumetric flask, so you can just add an approximate amount of NOH to an approximate amount of water, one liter to whatever you need to get, uh, whatever you need of weight of NOH to get to that particular concentration, and not worry about it being exact. When you standardize using potassium uh, acid phthalate, standard base, it will give you the exact concentration of your NOH. And you'll do that in the lab next week. So there is a procedure that you will follow to prepare the potassium acid phthalate that you will use to standardize your NUH and determine the exact normality of the solution you're preparing in the lab. Just a little bit of practice, again, for reagent preparation. So go back to that piece of paper of yours. And practice calculating number of moles of calcium in 25 grams of calcium chloride uh, dihydrate. So what you need to know, you want to know what's the relationship between weight and number of moles? What's the equation there? Number of moles equals what? Huh? Mass over molar mass or molecular mass. That is the first equation you need to know. So number of moles equals mass in grams over molecular or molar weight or mass in grams. Will give you number of moles. The other the thing that you need to know in order to calculate molecular weight. What's the molecular weight of calcium? Now I'm from the chemistry. Huh? You just looked it up? What is it? 
Well, let's go with 40. And then uh, chloride, 35.5, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay. So now, knowing this equation and knowing that, you should be able to calculate number of moles. All right, do you have a value? There you go, 0.17 moles. Okay. All right, so this next one will be rele relevant to your pre-lab quiz that you will prepare for next uh, lab, next week. So, two hints I'm gonna give you. First of all, in order to determine the dilution, you wanna make sure you have the same unit. So for the first one, you have the same unit as your final uh, unit, basically, molarity and molarity. Second one, you have a percentage. So what you need to do is convert percentage to molarity. All right? And in order to do that, you will use this equation as well. But remember, number of moles is, the molarity is number of moles per one liter. That is another hint, okay? And you need the sodium is 23, the molecular weight of sodium. So yeah, give it a go. Do you have a question? For the first one? Yeah. So first one, you remember another hint? Huh? Oh, you want the answer? <laughs> You're very quick. Okay, what was the answer for the first one? Yeah, yeah. So you can use the n by v equal n by v, which you can also use n by v equal n by v, or like you said, concentration, any form of concentration uh, times your volume. So. So what was the V2? 66 milliliter and dilute up to a liter. Very good, so the first one is solved. You ready with the second one, Ben? Are, or are you still thinking? It's a percentage, right? Percent. And cent is 100. So this is 45 grams in 100 milliliter. So the first step you want to do is convert it to per liter. That's the fourth hint. <laughs> Okay. 
me know when you're ready. Or at least one of you ready. Okay, are you ready? No. Everybody looking at me or asking this question, him or her. Buddy, you ready? No, not, sure. not sure with all the four or five hints that I've given? Drew, you ready? Huh? I'm getting there. <laughs> you looked at me. <laughs> ben, you ready? Okay, so? for being a TA in the future. Uh, I thought TA was great for us. What? I thought TA was great for us. No. <laughs> You're going to talk to the class. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait, um, so 45% weight to volume would be um, according to Pam. According to Pam. Uh, grams per pound amount. Yeah. And um, big M is in a liter base, so we wanted to change that to a liter base. One liter. Very good. And we know the molecular weight of NaOH equals to um, Forty. Na is 23 plus OH is 16 plus Y equals 40 mm -hmm. grams per mole per mole. Mm -hmm. And in our stock solution, we have this much NaOH in one liter. So 45, well, 150 grams divided by 40 grams per mole. Give you about one, one, five moles Mons. per liter. Per liter. Mm -hmm. And this part is just a pound. <coughs> yeah. And you just use that equation again. Yeah. This is basically to question one. Yes, exactly. That wasn't too hard. No, I'm just. Yeah. My hand <laughs> All right, here it is. So the first one is applying m by v equals m by v. You get the milliliter. Remember that you have to complete and tell us what you do with the milliliters. <coughs> you take this much from P molar and your H, and you make up to one liter uh, in a volumetric flask. And this one we convert to grams per liter. We apply number of moles equal to mass over molecular weight, same what Ben wrote over there, and the molarity would be number of moles per liter. And then you apply the same equation and you get 17.8 per liter. You take from the 45% and you age and you made it up to one liter. Do you have any questions? This is the time if you'd like any clarification on the calculation. I just want to remind you from now on in exams and quizzes there will be calculations. More than um, chromatography and spectroscopy. This is the calculation section of the class. Okay. So I assume you all know how to do it. Perfect. Okay, let's add some more complicated calculations. Fun. 
at least fun to me. Uh, we want to prepare a buffer. And always, a rule of thumb, when you want to prepare a buffer, there is the salt and there's the acid. So you want to know how much of that salt you want to uh, add to the acid to get a certain buffer with a particular pH. So you want to know the pKa of your acid that you're using to prepare the salt. So there's a conjugate base, which is your salt, and then there's the acid to prepare the buffer. Okay? So you have the information here to do from your calculations. So we want to prepare a buffer at pH 4.6. Okay? And then you want also the concentration of the buffer to be one molar. Sometimes your concentration of the buffer is 0 0.01 molar, 0 0.1 molar, 0 0.05 molar, because the salt in the buffer is important for the reaction, whatever you're using that buffer for. So it's not just the pH that is important, the salt concentration is important for a reaction. So always you want to know what the concentration of the buffer is going to be in addition to the pH in order to prepare that buffer. So here I'm telling you we're preparing a buffer at pH 4.6 and has a concentration of one molar. And you have a stock solution of your acid, which is three molar stock solution. And then you have your base or conjugate base, in this case your sodium acetate powder. So this you want to make it into a solution. So you have it in a powder form, and I'm giving you the molecular weight of it. And I'm giving you the Ka of acetic acid, just to add some complication here. Um, so you want to convert the Ka to pKa. Do you know how you convert that? pKa equals yeah. negative log Ka. Yeah. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> I forgot that I gave that hint. Okay, never mind. So it's right there. And how would you prefer, prepare one liter? So I'm giving you the final volume as well of that buffer. <laughs> Sometimes I might tell you 250 milliliter of the buffer or 500 milliliter of that buffer. In this case, I'm giving you a liter as the final volume. So there are two different ways in preparing or calculating. One I feel is simpler than the other, and I use the simpler way. But depending on what the preference of people are, um, you can determine volume right away that you need from each of the reagents, or prepare concent or calculate concentration first and then convert to volume. I do. I standardize first the concentration, and then I calculate volume right away. That's how I would do it. But I leave it up to you to figure that one out. Give it a thought, and a brave soul will give me, um, will give you hint. Who took chemical reactions last spring? Don't be shy now, raise your hand. Bailey, Michelle. So you are expert, Bill. Is blushing. <laughs> Only just the three of you? And somebody else is not confessing? Okay, so Bailey. <laughs> solution of acetic acid and one molar solution of acetate powder. That's the first thing I would do 
And then I will apply the, the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, and instead of the concentration, I will just use volume, because I know that the final volume is one liter. So if I prepare each reagent at the same concentration that is the final concentration that I want, and then I use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, and instead of plugging in concentration, I will just put uh, the volume over a thousand minus the volume of the base. Right? So the concentration will be volume in that case in this equation. Other people will do the same, will get a different, I mean the opposite, will get the concentration in moles and go back to calculate what they need to get out of this and this to get the exact moles they need in their one liter, which I think it's a longer way of doing it. Who wants to come up and show us? Not even one's brave soul. Okay. I thought, I thought Jesse was going to do it. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to do it. So for the acid solution, so let you apply the same thing, 3M, 3 molar times, let's say I want to prepare 1 liter or 1,000 milliliter to make it easy. And then I want, uh, no. x in milliliter times the final molarity that I want times one liter. What would be the x here? 332 you said? 3333. 3333? Okay. Alright, so I will take 333 milliliter of my acid stock solution and dilute it up to one liter. That's the first one. Second one, I want to prepare one molar of this. So number of moles equal mass over molecular weight, which is 82. And then I want it to be one mole per liter so I need 82 grams. So I will weigh out 82 grams in one liter. So now I have two stock solution, each at one molar concentration. Okay? Then it becomes easy after, after this. Then your pH is equal pKa plus log in this case, I'm just going to call it um, the volume of the conjugate base over 1,000 milliliter minus the volume. So I'm solving for the volume of the conjugate base in this case. Okay. So plug in numbers, 4.6. What's the pKa? 4.76. Uh, what's that? 4.76. 4.76 plus log V over 1,000 minus V. So what's get me to V, 1,000 minus V equal? Huh? 0 0.62? I don't think that's correct. 0.48. What? 0.48. 0.48. So your volume equal 480. Um, the uh, the volume equal 0.48. Okay, you get you're going ahead of me. Just okay. give me this value. Uh, point six nine three. Point so Vivi was right from the beginning. What was it, Vivi? Point six nine two. 
0.692, like that? Okay. So volume equals 692 minus 0.692V. 1.692V equals 692. Then the volume equal? 41 ml. Huh? 41 ml. For what? 41 ml. 41? No, it can't be 41. 692 divided by 1692. 409. This? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So 408 milliliter of your conjugate base of the solution where you dissolved 82 grams in one liter will get you sodium acetate. So your sodium acetate you need to get, of the one molar solution, you need to get 408 ml and mix it with 592 milliliter, which is 1,000 minus 408. So you 592 milliliter of that one molar solution that you prepared here of your acetic acid. Yes, Ben? So um, what's so what, so about one molar? Huh? What's the, the concentration of one molar? Yep. Is that the concentration of the acid ion? Or? The, the, yeah, the, the acetate, basically. So we're calculating based on the salt, not the acid? Well, it is equimolar. Well, equimolar when they're both at one molar concentration, then they become equimolar. Because here you have acetic acid, that means acetate plus the proton. Right. And here you have sodium acetate. So they're, they're the same thing, basically. You are, the molarity is the same for both of them. That's why you, you calculate the molarity. You produce the same molar here and the same molar there. So you're ignoring... So, so since they're the same, do you just use volume? Yes, because yes, because I prepared the same molarity at the beginning, then I would take the volume only. Some people would calculate the, the amount of number of moles you would need and then go back to prepare one liter of that. Okay. Yeah? So I started differently. I feel this is easier, but different people, different training choose it, choose doing it differently. But there is acetate here and a proton, acetate here and a sodium. Okay? All right. For fun and more practice, this is a previous exam from eight years ago. But it has another example for how to prepare a buffer, so you can practice with that. Okay, so titratable acidity, how do we calculate it? So I'm going to derive this equation for you. If you understand, you can memorize the equation or understand how we derive it. So if you forget it, you can get it on your own. Am I being optimistic? <laughs> okay. So at point of equivalence, you, are, you all know that equivalence of base equal equivalence of acid, right? Milli equivalent equals milli equivalent, or equivalent equal equivalent. Um, so, so n by v is your equivalent for acid, for example, and then you have n by v equal equivalent of base. So at equilibrium, you have n by v acid equal n by v base. So 
we want to determine percent acid, usually it's either weight by weight or weight by volume. So basically we want to know our weight of the acid in let's say in milk or in uh, orange juice or in 7-Up or whatever. So I'm after the weight of the acid which I can divide by the weight of the sample and multiply by 100 to get a percentage. But now how do I, how did I get all of this, these different values in between? So you want to remember when you are titrating with the base, you already have the normality of the base. You're actually going to get that normality in the lab when you standardize your NUH. So you'll have that value. The volume of the base is the titrant. You get it from titrating. So you will read the volume in your titrate, uh, in your burette at the equilibrium point. So you have that and you have that. Here is where, where you um, have to derive the equation. Okay. So when you have n by v equal equivalence, that means your normality equal number of moles of equivalence per volume, which is usually equivalence per one liter. And that's where this comes from. Okay? Now what you want to remember is number of equivalence, which is this value, equal mass or weight, basically, in grams over equivalent weight. The equivalent weight, if you remember from last lecture, is your molecular weight divided by the number of protons that the acid can give. Okay? So if you have one carboxyl group, so you have one proton that you can give, or the acid can give. If you have two, then you will have two moles of that proton that you can give. Or three carboxyl groups, you will have three, right? So that's your equivalent weight. Equivalent weight equal molecular weight divided by the number of moles of proton or number of equivalents of the pot. Uh, I'm just going to put it for simplicity. OK? So now, let me substitute. You guys in the back can't see if I write here, right? Just... OK. So now I'm going to substitute equivalent in this equation right here. So I'm going to say N, I'm going to bring that V here again, times V, equal mass over equivalent weight. Okay? And this, at equilibrium, so this is for acid, so I'm substituting this for this equals N by V of base. Are you following so far? Okay. I want the mass of the acid. So mass or weight of the acid equals N by V of the base times equivalent weight, okay? We're all following? You can ask if, if I'm going fast. I'll just take 30 seconds before heading out and then you want percentage. So you will go percent acid 
weight of your sample or volume of your sample. So weight of sample or volume of sample times 100. Okay? Usually your volume when you titrate, it's in milliliter because you have uh, your burette, you fill it in, and usually the volume is in milliliter, not in liters. So you divide by li by 1,000 to convert to liter because this is per liter. So this is for correction to the, the liter unit, and that's your equation right there. Okay? If you know this concept and you know this, then you can get this equation. Or memorize that. Giving you both options here. Um, this is practice on your own. It's basically just applying the equation. The only thing you, you want to know is 192 is the molecular weight. Listen, just one second of your time. 192 molecular weight, Sven, you have three carboxyl groups, so 192 divided by three to get the equivalent weight. And that's what you plug in in the equation right here. So you want to know what acid and how many carboxyl groups the acid has. Usually in an exam, I'll give you the hint of how many if I give you two pKa's, you know that there is two carboxyl, there are two carboxyl groups. That could be my way of giving you a hint, okay? So solve this. This is the answer if you get 0.6%. That's your answer. Take a picture like Jeshu is doing, smart. And then this is just to point out that uh, you want to make it reasonable. Percent acidity is usually a very small percentage. There is one more slide that I'll go over on Wednesday. So everything up to here, you're responsible for in the exam. Okay, sorry I took five minutes more, I just wanna finish this.